Hello, my name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President of, of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and we highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is affected by it. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share comments with us on Twitter at the Fortune Society SOC. Today, we're going to talk about something that's really, really important and significant in this day and time, and that's about people that are aging in prison. Americans are aging in prison far too more, far too often than it, they're not. And what it needs, what's needed now is a reduction in that. When we think about the elderly that are in prison throughout the United States and this rise in the elderly population in prison, we know that there's a much needed change that has to happen. Right now, studies show that this groundswell of people aging in prison has all to do with mandatory minimums, the three strikes you're out laws, and other laws and practices that were put in place, namely around the issue of eliminating federal parole that has caused the increase of people aging in prison. It's projected that by the year 2030, more than 400,000 elderly people will be behind bars. And so members of the people that are aged 50 years old has actually doubled after the year 2000. To address this issue and to really amplify this issue, um, we have joining us today someone from an organization called RAP, Releasing Aging People from Prison. RAP, which stands for Releasing Aging People in Prison, was established several years ago by its founder, Mujib Fareed. And today, who assumes that role of leadership in moving that organization along is none other than my dear friend and colleague, um, Jose Saldana, who serves as the director of RAP, Releasing Aging People in Prison. Jose, welcome to Both Sides of the Bars. How are you doing today? I'm good, and thank you very much for inviting me. You know, I wanted to talk to you, Jose. I know that, you know, you've been doing this work for many, many years, even prior to, like, your release, and certainly getting into how long you served time in prison and, like, why you become so passionate about that. I think that's really, really important. And so talk to our listening audience hubs about, like, your experiences, um, what has led you to this work of wanting to um, create these opportunities for people to be released who are aging in prison? Yes, I was repeatedly denied parole by the New York State Parole Board. For those who are not familiar, when you're given a sentence like I was, 25 years to life, that means that you will serve 25 years, and at that 25th year, you will appear before a parole board who is supposed to evaluate whether you're now suitable to return back to society. Well, I was repeatedly denied as the co-founder and leader of this organization, Rap. He was repeatedly denied 10 times. I wasn't denied as many times as he was, but I know others who have been denied 14, 15, 16 times. In fact, when I was released from prison after 38 years, I left behind some of my mentors who should have been walking out with me, if not before me. And one of these persons, his name is Sali Ali Abdullah. Sali Ali was convicted in 1972. He served 48 years when he appeared before his 14th parole board. That's 48 years? He, was, 48 he years? served 48 years when he appeared before his 14th parole board. So when we talk now, about he, 14th parole board, Hamza, uh, Jose, I want to stop you there. We say 14th parole board. For our listening audience, like how many, t I mean, what makes up one parole board? Is it one year, two years? And if it's two years, well, they, 14, what is he, that? He, was, he was denied parole and repeatedly denied for two year holes. In certain cases, he was denied for one year hold, then back to two years, then one year. But it all added up to exactly 23 years of parole denials. That so almost he spent an doubled. additional 23 years in prison based on parole denials. He finished his sentence already. Parole denial. So he That's finished his exactly right. sentence, 
But he did 23 he additional years. 23 additional years. Mm -hmm. and, the, and this is my mentor, one of my mentors. This man was a college educator. He had several college degrees, and he had been instrumental in, in, in transforming the lives, not only of me, but literally, in four mm -hmm. decades, literally a generation of younger men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's 73 years old and appears before the Pro Bowl for the 14th time. And during the hearing, he asks the commissioners, may I be excused to go to the bathroom? And they say, certainly, they excuse him, let him go to use the men's room, and he never returned. While in the men's room, he has a massive stroke. Wow. And never recovered. 10 days later, in an outside hospital, he passes away. And this is the tragic injustice. His co-defendants in prison for the same, exact same crime have been released. One had been released 10 years ago, but yet they held on to him. And the greatest tragedy is that the Police Benevolent Association made a statement after the media reported that he had passed away, that justice was served. So Jose, given this example, right, this tragic example, this inhumane example, right, obviously of denying someone release at the, I mean, deciding someone release 14 times after they've served their sentence while incarcerated, right, has what is what has kind of developed and led to, right, the creation of what is now considered rat. Releasing exactly. aging people in prison. So talk to us, Hamza, like, what is RAP? What does it focus on? RAP, RAP, RAP is a grassroots community organizing and advocacy campaign that works to end mass incarceration to the release of aging people in prison and those serving long-term sentences as a means of uprooting the legacy of racism. Because we know at the root of all these things, at the root of men languishing in prison until death or until their release in their 80s where they become a burden on everyone. So RAP tries to initiate legislative uh, uh, initiatives that will address this crisis of men and women languishing in years for longer, longer periods of time, getting old, sick, and needlessly dying. And these bills, we call the Elder Parole Bill. The Elder Parole Bill simply provides that if a person has reached 55 years old and has served 15 years, this person would be entitled to a parole review. It's not an automatic release. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's just, it provides hope to the hopeless. And the fair and timely parole bill, which would have helped Sarley and just literally thousands of others just like him, provides that the risk to public safety cannot be solely determined on a crime that was committed four decades ago. Absolutely. In my case, thir three and a, three and a, three, 38 years ago. Right, that that risk to public decades, safety has to, be, it has to be current. It has to be a current risk to public safety. Right. You know, so, I mean, and, 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 and this and this and had this law been enacted when it should have been two years ago, mm -hmm. the parole board would have used a different standard for Sully and the countless of other men and women who they denied parole based on the one thing no one could ever change. Absolutely, Jose. And when we when you're talking about rap and its importance as an organization and the campaign that it's leading, right? There's also the other part of it too, right? Like keeping people incarcerated longer, especially people who are aging in prison and who may develop medical challenges is a burden to the state in some instances, right? Like talk about that, because there's cost savings. You continue to incarcerate people, keep people incarcerated, right? It's more of a cost to the state to keep people incarcerated than to release them back to their families and their communities. Talk to us a little bit about that, Jose. It, it causes roughly and this is these are estimates by by the department of correction mm -hmm. one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year for one elderly person up to 140 to 240. so you times that 
by the 9,000, over 9,000 men and women incarcerated in New York State that are age 50 and over, mm -hmm. times that by 140, you got hundreds of millions of dollars that are needlessly spent on keeping men and women in prison when they could be a service and an asset to their home communities. We're talking about men and women who have been mentors and educators for decades. They have helped, like I said, an entire generation of younger people, me. And I was convicted of a very violent crime. They have helped me transform my life. They could do the same thing in their communities, but they're wasting millions, hundreds of millions of dollars keeping these men in prison for what? Vengeance? Instead of using that money, because that money could be allocated for the much needed services in our communities. We see that, that COVID-19 exposes the disparity uh -huh. of, of our communities. Absolutely. Jose. And, and we're know, not, we we're could not, be addressing these things. And of course, and we're not suggesting, we're not trivializing or like minimizing the harm that folk who were incarcerated may have caused 30 years ago or so. But to your point, Jose, that was 30 years ago, right? And so there's this whole argument, obviously, that you and others and us lift up that like the nature of the, the person's crime will never change. Right. So like talk a little bit about that too, Hamza, because I know Jose, and I'm using your name, Hamza and Jose interchangeably, right? About that whole notion, right? That you're keeping people incarcerated, continuing to give people two years at the parole board because of the nature of their crime. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, and I want to mention something that I'm 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 almost positive that our viewing public do not know. The New York State Department of Correction does not offer incarcerated men and women, not a one single therapeutic program to help us learn how to take responsibility for the crime we committed and develop insight into the harm that our crimes inflicted on innocent people. Not a single program, none, zero. You would think that you were in prison to be rehabilitated. That's the first thing you would do, address that thinking that led us to harm people, but they don't guess, offer us a single program. And guess who does that though, Jose, right? Mentors like yourself, like you and us and others exactly. are incarcerated. We created those internal things we, to address our create, own responsibility, we right? We create those effective programs that have helped generation of men and women transform their life and become returning citizens in the truest sense of that term and concept returning citizens back to our communities to help repair the harm, help revitalize our communities, help address the crisis of our youth, help address crime in our communities and violence and gangs. We are the original credible messengers. Absolutely, Hamza. And so, I mean, talk to us about some of the things that RAP is doing now, right? I know that, you know, again, RAP has been strongly engaged and advancing legislation, and we're looking to have a legislative win as we continue to push this yeah. campaign, right? Talk about some of the mm -hmm. stuff that you all have been doing um, to lift that up and amplify that issue. Well, we have, we, we've been, we've been first, you know, the narrative, mm -hmm. the image that people have of incarcerated men and women who have committed violent, violent crimes, mm -hmm. who have harmed people, in a, in a very serious way. Like I said, we, we understand this. We fully understand this. And some of us also suffered harm. We, it's not like we don't know what that's, that feels like. Some the of us hurt people, have, hurt have people. suffered harm. Or the idea um, of hurt people hurt people. So we've been educating the community, just opening up this discussion. What is punishment? And what should justice look like? Let's not just accept that justice is revenge, that this is what justice should be about. Let's discuss what punishment should be and what justice should be. And some of us have parameters. We have guidance on what justice should be by the faith that we follow. Mm -hmm. Let's not throw that away when we're dealing with human beings. You know, we have men and women languishing in prison. They should deserve whatever humane sense of justice we have for ourselves, we should have for every human being. So we dis we have to open this discussion in the basic in a very basic way, because men and women 
and I, and I can speak for New York State because this is where I did my time, but in, in other states is the same way. The federal system is the same way. Men and women in prison transform their lives to an extent that they are unrecognizable from the man that committed the crime. Mm -hmm. They are the most civic-minded people returning to their communities. So this is what we're saying. Rap originated from this sense that the elder people are the safest people to let out. Mm -hmm. Because first, criminology, uh, uh, socially, everyone agrees that as a person ages, they age out of crime. I was released at 66 years old. In that age category, I was less than 1%. I had a 1% recidivist rate, less than 1% of ever committing another crime. And they acknowledged this, but still deny me parole right. since I was 60 years old. But the thing is that, so we, we focus on this group because everybody can sympathize with a group of men who are elderly and in prison, 55 is, is not as young as people appear. Mm -hmm. in, in, in our society. 55 in prison, and this is another proven fact, is closer to 65 years old because people age, so they, they accelerate at a fast, much faster pace than mm -hmm. in society. Because not only the conditions, but the loneliness, losing family members, not being able to see your kids grow up, all these way in, and a 55 year old man is closer to 65 years old. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that these men, who reached 55 years old should have the opportunity, just the opportunity to be considered for release, no matter what the crime they committed. Because in my opinion, and in rap, we have the fundamental principle that we cannot and will never exclude people from justice. We, we, we are attached to our history as a people. Historically, we, they, European supreme, white supremacists have tried to exclude us from the human race with three-fifths men. Exclude us from the human race. We've been excluded from every beneficial function in society, voting, education, uh, employment, and we continue to be excluded and, and, and marginalized. So we will not turn around and do the same thing to anybody based on the crime of conviction or the length of sentence. We say that parole justice is for everyone. And so, Hamza, you know, as you're talking about, you know, obviously parole justice is for everyone. Um, RAP has obviously launched several campaigns, right, several ways in which to advance the campaign. Talk about some of those things that you've all been doing um, relative to that, right? I know you have, like, some rallies that you've done, some other things that you've done. Well, of course, we, we do a lot of organizing in our community to get community support, get commu the community to support our legislative initiative. Mm -hmm. the humanity of these bills that we advocate for. And we also educate the legislators because up until rap showed on the scene, surprisingly, our legislators didn't even know what parole was. Right. Here they are routinely confirming parole commissioners to be uh, 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 sit on the parole board and know nothing about the real function of the parole board. So we also, not only we educating our community, but we educating our legislators. To this point where we are very close, we are very close to getting a majority and we're hoping that this session coming up, we will have the numbers in the Senate. We, we need 10 more senators to have the majority for the elder parole bill. And we need roughly 13 more for the fair and tiny parole bill in the Senate. So we're making a lot of progress, but we still need that, that critical mass support to get these bills passed. And so Hamza, talk to us about like ways in which obviously people can get involved and support rap, right? Because as you said, right, you need more people. You need this more of this, this groundswell of support, right? Not just here in New York State, but which is obviously important as we're looking to lead that, but throughout the entire country, right? Because we know that people aging in prison is not a local or state phenomenon here in New York, right? It's a national phenomenon. Talk a little bit about that, Hamza. But, you know, but surprisingly, and maybe it's not really too surprisingly, New York leads. The advocacy community leads the country in advocating for these type of bills. In fact, 
you have um, Pennsylvania and, and California is actually modeling their parole reform bills on our elder parole. So we are taking the lead and New York is supposed to be an empire state, it's a democratic state. They should take the lead in these type of reform. Everyone recognizes that mass incarceration is not a myth, it's a reality, and that mass incarceration, oh. incarceration has harmed people. So let's correct these things. Our bills will correct the harm that continues to impact people that are still languishing in prison for four decades or better. And it will guarantee that the future generation will not suffer the same type of harm. What we ask of our members of our community is to get in contact with your legislature, legislature. Senators and assemblymen, visit RAP website, and tell them to support the elder parole bill and the fair and timely parole bill. This bill will guarantee that men and women will not suffer in prison needlessly and, and, and in most cases die. Let me just tell you a story about a man I just found out about this two weeks ago. I don't know this man personally. He's in his seventies. He's been in prison for 44 years, denied parole 10 times. 44 years, 70 years old, denied parole 10 times, and he has stage four kidney failure. Stage four kidney failure. Now, what is, is that how we define justice? By keeping a man who has stage four kidney failure? And we'll talk about why wait until this happens. Release the elderly who has been so instrumental in, in helping others transform themselves. Release them at a period in their lives where they can be a benefit to society. They can be a benefit to their home communities immediately upon release. Mm -hmm. Stage four cancer. Um, so stage, so you, stage four kidney, kidney failure. Stage, stage four, four kidney failure. Yeah. And so again, we're going back to the huge cost, right, associated with keeping someone out. The person can obviously get better treatment once released, family support, community support. It's just, it just, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. And, and, the, and, and the reality is we're talking about black and brown people. That's what, you know, this is, who, this is who dominates our prisons in New York. We're talking about black and brown people who are suffering like this. And it hurts our community. If you take away, you, 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 you create a situation of permanent family separation. It hurts our families and it hurts our communities. And it keeps our communities marginalized. And, and in most cases, it takes the leadership from our communities. Now, rap has been along, how long it's been around, uh, Hamza? Rap has been around seven years, how long? about seven, around. seven, eight years. Seven, seven eight, eight years. years. And I'm made to reflect on uh, Mujahid Farid and obviously his contribution to this work. And now, like, you are heading up this work. Um, and it, how does that feel, obviously, Hamza? I mean, you're heading this work now. It's a lot. Like what keeps you motivated, right, and inspired? Well, you know, when, when I was uh, when I was battling with the New York State Parole Board, I heard about rap. I got in contact with rap. I got in contact with Pari, and we started corresponding. And and what rap did at that time, and this is 2017, rap challenged the composition of the New York State Parole Board, which was dominated by people from law enforcement background, prosecutors, sheriffs, detectives, New York City police officers, parole officers. This is who dominated the New York State Parole Board. This, these were the commissioners that could not see past the crime that was committed decades ago. And they made decisions strictly on the crime that was committed. They could not value transformation. Perhaps it's in their or upbringing as, as professional law enforcement men, but they just simply could not believe that human beings can transform their lives. So they were making decisions exclusively on the nature of the crime. Mm -hmm. and, and they were very being very biased and, and unfair to all those they were denying parole board, including myself. What Fareed and the early rap members did was expose this, these improprieties by these commissioners, expose them using parole hearing minutes and court decisions where the judges actually condemn their behavior as parole commissioners. 
but he could not release anyone. The, the judge, all the judge could do is order a new hearing and also order that the person is not to, the, uh, the parole commissioners that, that denies him are not to sit on the next panel. That's the best that the judges can do. So he presented all this to the governor's office. And when their term expired, the governor did not reappoint them as he customarily does. Instead, he reappointed six new commissioners, all from diversified background, from social work services, teachers, from the clergy, people who can embrace that human beings can transform their life. Absolutely. And I appeared before one of those newly appointed commissioners in 2017 of November, late November, 2017. Uh -huh. And unlike all the other hearings I had, she only asked me one question about the crime I committed in 1979. And then her next word, now let's talk about what you've been doing the last 38 years of your life. Right. And based upon what I've been doing the last 38 years of my life, she granted me parole. And in January of 2018, I walked out Greenhaven State Prison. And when I walked out, I'm, my brothers were driving me from the prison. I looked back and I almost heard the men that I left behind. Yeah. I almost heard them in my, in, my, in my mind. I heard them, you know, cheering me on. That's right. Now I could not go on with my life as if they never existed. I Absolutely. just could not do that. Absolutely. You know, uh, some, some men, could. I, I, I just couldn't do that. And I knew that I owe something to rap. Rap, rap was instrumental in me being released. The work that they did, that Muta Hefuri and, and, and Laura and Kathy did, resulted in my release. I had a well, moral obligation. Absolutely. I had a moral obligation. Absolutely, Hamza. And so in our closing, in closing comments, Hamza, we got a couple of minutes left. We have a new president. We have a new vice president. What is the rap campaign around elder parole and fair and timely parole? What does that mean as it relates to this new administration? What is rap's thinking on how they're going to engage them? Well, uh, uh, to be frank, uh, Andre, you know, um, we we can we can. Uh, develop our strategies. We can develop this movement based on the national level of politics. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that this is a new era. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that those who are complicit in mass incarceration will now, you know, be complicit in ending it, be complicit in promoting, promoting racial justice. Uh, I'm hopeful. But we have to continue to fight for the men that we left behind, irrespective of what the national scene looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, Hamza, thank you so much for joining both sides of the bars. We really appreciate that. On behalf of the Fortune Society, you on behalf of the Fortune Society, you have been listening to both sides of the bars. Our friend and dear colleague Jose Hamza Saldana has just joined us. And Hamza, we certainly look forward to you coming back and joining us here for both sides of the bars. Thank you so much and tune in to our next episode of okay. Fortune Society's Both Sides of the Bars. Thank you. Thank you.